So we're going to start out with uh, chapter 13. Um, chapter 13 is on the spinal cord and the spinal nerves. Right, so this picture up here, it's kind of showing you both chapters 13 and 14, so I'm just gonna kind of explain the difference between the two. In chapter 13, we're just going to be dealing with the spinal cord here, right? And so right here, and we're gonna look at the spinal nerves coming off of the spinal cord, right? And then when we get to chapter 14, then we're gonna look at the brain, so all of this, and we're gonna look at the cranial nerves going into the brain. So that's basically how chapter 13 and 14 are split up, right? So we're really just looking at the spinal nerves and the spinal cord. Now, um, when we are looking at the spinal cord and the spinal nerves, um, we're going to be looking at things like um, the sensory receptors. So sensory receptors um, are going to stimulate a sensory neuron and bring information into the spinal cord. And then once in the spinal cord, it's, that information can travel up to the brain, and then the brain can figure out what it wants to do about it, right? And after that, then, um, there will be a command that will be sent out uh, that will leave the spinal cord through a motor neuron and it'll go out to an effector, right? They're both going out through spinal nerves. All of your spinal nerves contain both sensory and motor neurons, right? They contain both of these. I drew them on opposite sides, but really that could all happen in one spinal nerve, one nerve that's coming off of the spinal cord, right? So the effectors that we are um, talking about are these. The effectors are going to be skeletal muscle, smooth muscle, cardiac muscles, glands, and adipose tissue. Okay. So any one of those can be receiving a command. And we'll talk later about what the response of those effectors will be. Right? There's another thing, and probably the biggest part of this chapter is going to be reflexes. So a reflex is where um, under unconscious control, Sensory information will come into the spinal cord and then a motor command will go right out again, right? So now in here, where I drew it in here, um, there's gonna be a synapse or multiple synapses. So that's, that's probably half of this chapter is going over the different types of reflexes that there are. Right? All right, so this is an adult spinal cord and I just wanna go over the spinal cord and how that relates to the spine so that you can see all of that. When we look at the adult spinal cord, we're gonna see that there are uh, four different sections of the spinal cord. And so the top section of the spinal cord, we're gonna call the cervical um, spinal, this is the cervical section. Then we have the thoracic section. Then we have the lumbar. And then we have the sacral. Okay, so there's four different sections. And in the cervical, uh, coming off of the cervical spinal cord, there will be eight spinal nerves, okay? The thoracic will have 12 spinal nerves, and I should say pairs, right? There's gonna be pairs, because there's, um, there's spinal nerves coming off of both sides, the right and the left. So there would be eight on each side. I don't have those drawn eight in, but there's eight on each side, right? Eight pairs. And so the first um, pair of spinal nerves that come off would be C1, and the last pair would be C8. So there's C1 on the right and C1 on the left. C2, C3, C4, all the way down to C8 on the right, C1 through C8 on the left, okay? Then we look at um, the thoracic, and there's 12 pairs in the thoracic area. In the lumbar, there's five, and in the sacral, there's five, right? So again, we number them as, um, there would, in the thoracic, it would start out at T1, and it would go all the way down to T12. In the lumbar, the first uh, spinal nerve would be L1, and the last one would be L5. Sacrum, uh, they would be S1 all the way down to S5, right? So we number those. So when people have injuries, that's what we talk about. 
they have an injury to their L4-5 spinal, L4 and L5 spinal nerves, right? So we know when we were looking at the spinal, um, the spine itself, all of this makes sense because there's 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, five sacral vertebrae, but how many, uh, five sacral, but how many cervical vertebrae are there? Right, there's only seven. And so the reason why we have eight spinal nerves is that the first spinal nerve is going to exit above the first spinal, um, first vertebrae, and the second one will exit from the spine between the first and second. So if we just keep going down, you can see where they're exiting then, okay? And you count up all of those, they end up being eight. So we have eight spinal nerves in the cervical vertebrae. Just because the first one exits above C1 vertebrae, and the last cervical spinal nerve exits below C7 vertebrae. So we just end up with eight. Okay, um, the other thing that we want to look at here is that um, if you look at the size of the spinal cord, it is a lot shorter than the spine itself, right? It's a lot shorter. It actually ends right down here at about L1 to L2. That's where it ends, um, in between the L1 and the L2 vertebrae. And so um, when, the, when the nerves are all coming off of the spinal cord, they have to come out of their respective areas, right? They all have to come out where they're supposed to come out. And then um, as we get down towards the end of the thoracic and then into the lumbar, they're gonna start going, uh, be having to be a little bit longer because they have to go underneath, they have to go a little bit longer. By the time we get to the, um, this, the lumbar area, now they're much longer because they take, they have to go really far inferior before they can exit where they're supposed to exit from the spine. And then the sacral have to be even longer, right? So the sacral ones are even longer. And so what we end up seeing as they are all exiting where they're supposed to exit, it looks like we have this great big horse's tail of spinal nerves because they're that long. And so we end up calling that the cauda equina. Cauda means tail, equina means horse, right? So that's the cauda equina. All right. So then we also want to look at the spinal cord itself again, and right around the cervical area, there is an enlargement there, and we call that the cervical enlargement. And as we look down in the lumbar area, there's going to be in the, um, actually it's closer to like the lumbar um, thoracic area, there's another enlargement. So these are because it's, we need more um, innervation for the arms and the legs. So we end up with a cervical enlargement and we end up with a lumbar enlargement. It's just where the spinal cord has a bigger diameter in those areas. So the meninges are um, the protective covering surrounding the spinal cord. We have spinal meninges and then we have cranial meninges and they're continuous with each other. So the spinal meninges go up around the spine, and then right at that foramen magnum, then it becomes the cranial meninges. It has a little bit different um, structure to it in the brain, and we'll talk about that on, on Thursday, but we're gonna just look at the spinal meninges today, right? So there's three layers to that. This is on your uh, lab exam too. The, this would be the spinal cord right here, right? And then the very first layer um, on top of that is called the pia mater. So all of this is pia mater in here. It's really tightly adhered to the spinal cord. You would have to take tweezers and just pull it off and you'd be pulling off some of the neural tissue actually to get that off. It's very tightly adhered to it. In the, um, if you remember in the spinal cord you had the anterior uh, median fissure, right? and you had the posterior median sulcus. And so the pia mater actually goes into those areas. It goes into the um, anterior median fissure and the posterior median sulcus. It's just really tightly adhered to it. The next layer then that we have is the um, arachnoid mater, okay? And then the most superficial layer that we have is the dura mater.
right? So the dura mater is the toughest, most protective layer of the meninges. All of them are going to protect. The dura mater is just the most protective. Now, in between each one of those layers, there's a space. Okay, so we have spaces. Um, so if we look over here, this is on this side over here, we have, we sh I'm showing the spaces. So I just kind of want to go through those so you know what those are. First of all, um, let's, let's um, go ahead and label these. So the outermost layer here, this is the dura mater. This is the arachnoid mater. Okay, and then the innermost layer here, this is the pia mater. So we've got the pia mater, arachnoid mater. And then we have the dura mater. So let's look at some of the spaces that we see with this. First of all, on the very outside of the spinal cord, there's going to be some um, fat. There's going to be a bunch of fat cells out there, right? It just helps to protect. And um, that space out there is called the epidural space. So epi means on top of, dural means the dural, dura mater. So it's on top of the dura mater. It's outside of the dura mater, right? So that's where epidural injections will go. That needle will go right into that space, and it's going to, um, that's where the uh, anesthesia will be injected. It's not even going to touch the dura mater at all, hopefully. If it touches the dura mater, a patient gets a bad headache. So we don't want to do that, right? Okay, then the space on the inside, in between the dura mater and the arachnoid mater, right in here, this space in here, okay, that is called the subdural space, subdural. Okay, so normally that space would not be there in a healthy human. Normally the dura mater and the arachnoid mater are just right together. It's only if there's some type of bleeding or something um, that would cause right in there that would cause there's only if there's bleeding then you would see that space in there otherwise you're not going to see that space okay what are they calling it? the subdural so sub because it's like a submarine it's underneath the dura mater okay then the next one that we see is the subarachnoid space and so that's going to be the one that's just underneath the uh, arachnoid mater so that's that space right in here, in between the arachnoid mater and the pia mater. And that space, again, is called the subarachnoid. Because again, sub means underneath, so it's underneath the arachnoid layer, the arachnoid mater. Okay? Now it's in the um, subarachnoid space, that's where you have cerebral spinal fluid right? That's where cerebral spinal fluid flows. So cerebral spinal fluid we're going to talk about when we get to the brain. It flows inside the brain and the ventricles and it's, it flows all the way down through the spinal cord, but then it comes up and it's going to flow all the way through that subarachnoid layer all the way around the, um, in that subarachnoid layer in the brain and the cranial meninges as well as in the subarachnoid layer in the, or space in the um, spinal cord. Okay, so now we're going to look at a cross-section of the spinal cord. And when we're looking at that, first of all, uh, we have white matter and we have gray matter, right? You guys remember white matter and gray matter? So all of this on the outside here, that is going to be the white matter. And all of this on the inside, that's going to be the gray matter, right? So if you remember from general a &P, White matter is mostly myelinated axons, and gray matter is mostly cell bodies. Cell bodies are gray because of the nissel bodies uh, inside the cell bodies of the neurons, right? So, so the white matter is, will be organized into columns, columns.
right? And columns are going to carry, they have tracks that are going to lead up to the brain, and there's tracks that lead down from the brain. And these tracks are extremely um, specific. So one tract will carry a certain information. It'll carry pain and temp. And it'll only go one direction. So it'll go up, right, towards the brain. That we would call an ascending tract. Then there's other tracks in the white matter that are descending tracks. And so a descending tract would be carrying motor commands down, right? And maybe it's carrying motor tracks, maybe it's carrying inf motor information to the viscera, right, to the organs. That would be one tract. Or maybe it's carrying um, that motor command to skeletal muscles. Then that would be a different tract, right? So we've got different tracts going on. So when we look at it and we break the, um, the white matter up, we have a posterior, a lateral, and an anterior white column. This is the anterior side, and we know it's anterior because of a couple of things. First of all, we have this fissure in here, and that's always on the anterior side, right? So I used to tell the students that if you look at that, it's, it's a, just a deeper area in there, a deeper indentation. That's the anterior median fissure, anterior median fissure. It's big enough, it's wide enough for ants to get in it. So it's anterior median fissure. Whereas the back side here, when we look at that, that is the um, posterior median sulcus. Posterior median sulcus. So that's one way that you can tell what's the back side and what's the front side. And now remember, another name for posterior is dorsal. And another name for anterior is ventral, right? So we want to keep in mind that too. So um, if we divide this up then into the three sections, in the anterior um, area here, this would be the anterior white column. The side then would be the lateral white column. And then on the back, we would have the posterior white column. So that gets important when we start talking about tracks. Where are these tracks located? And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we look at the gray matter, and the gray matter is going to be separated into um, nuclei. Now remember, the, cell, the gray matter is going to mostly have cell bodies in it, and so cell bodies always cluster in the peripheral nervous system. Cell bodies are clustered into ganglion or ganglia. In the central nervous system, they're going to cluster into what we call nuclei. So we have very specific areas for nuclei. And so when, the, um, when we have sensory information coming in, do you remember what spinal nerve root that information comes in through? Is it dorsal or ventral? So sensory information comes in through the dorsal. Motor commands go out through the ventral, right? So we have this over here. Um, this area here is called the dorsal root. And this bump there is called the dorsal root ganglion. So in this ganglion are going to be cell bodies, right? That's where cell bodies are. And then um, the neuron comes into the spinal cord, and it's going to go into this uh, posterior part of the spinal cord. And it's going to end up in one of two nuclei, depending on... Where is it coming from, right? So there, if, we, if we draw out two nuclei in there, the first nuclei here, this one is a somatic nuclei, and we call it the somatic sensory nuclei. That means it's coming from either the, the sensory information is coming from the environment, or it's coming from... So it's coming on the skin. You're feeling it on the skin, this sensory information. Or you're feeling it, um, it's your skeletal muscles, or it's your cartilage. One of these three things is causing um, a sensation. And so wherever that sensation is, it's coming into that somatic sensory nuclei, right? Right? So this is, um, right, so that's in, that's in that gray horn there, 
There are three different horns on the somatic nuclei. Um, we have this one out here. That one is called the posterior horn. We have another one in the middle. This one is called the lateral horn. And then we have one on the anterior side, and that one is called the um, <clears throat> anterior horn. Let's say you're feeling something on your skin. You're feeling some type of pain on your skin. Your skin got cut, your skin is, you know, something happened, something fell on your skin and your skin hurts, right? So that sensory information has to come in through a neuron through the dorsal root. It's gonna come into the dorsal root and then it's going to synapse on that um, posterior horn, somewhere in that posterior horn, right? The posterior horn is divided then into a somatic and a visceral area. So because it's on your skin, where would it actually synapse? Would it synapse on the somatic or the visceral? The somatic, right? Visceral is all from your, your insides. If you have pain on the inside, then um, that, that will then synapse on the visceral. Big message here, though, is the sensory information comes in through the dorsal root and it's going to synapse onto that posterior gray horn, right? Once it synapses, it's going to leave and it's going to, the next neuron is going to um, enter into the white column and then go up to the brain. So that's how that works. Synapses and then goes up to the brain, right? Now, if the brain is gonna send a motor command down, then that motor command is going to be coming down from the brain, and it's going to synapse in this horn, in either the lateral or the anterior horn, and then that information, the next neuron, is going to go out through the ventral horn, or through the ventral root. So sensory information comes in through the dorsal root, and motor commands are going to go out through the um, through the ventral root. So ventral is motor, sensory is dorsal. They're going to go out through either the lateral horn or the posterior horn. So somewhere either here or here. Okay. And which one it goes out through is just going to depend on is it sending a message to your viscera or is it sending a message to your skeletal muscles? The big point here was I'm just trying to show you the mapping that goes on in the spinal cord, how the spinal cord is arranged, right? So any type of sensory information, whether it's pain or temperature changes or vibration or tickling or whatever type of sensation it is, that sensation is always going to come in through the dorsal root. So it comes in through the dorsal root and then where is it going to stop? Well, if it's coming from your skin or your skeletal muscles, it's going to stop in the anterior gray horn right there in the somatic, in the somatic um, nuclei. But if it's coming from your viscera, if it's coming from like your abdominal area, then it's going to stop right here. It's still in that, um, it's still in the posterior horn, still in the posterior gray horn, but that's where it's going to stop, right there, right? Then that's going to synapse on to probably an interneuron, and the interneuron might go up to the brain. But then the brain is going to send down a command, and it's going to either tell your skeletal muscles to do something, or it's going to tell your viscera to do something. So when we look at that, we're going to look at both the lateral and the anterior gray horns. And so a, a command will be coming out from either the lateral or the anterior gray horn, right? If that motor command is going to your, like your viscera, to your organs, it's going to come out of that lateral gray horn. But if it's going out to your skeletal muscles, then it's going to come out from the, that, that neuron will come from that anterior gray horn. Now, these, both of these, the sensory neuron, which is right here, and the motor neuron, which is right here, 
they come together to form the spinal nerve, right? The spinal nerve. Now, the spinal nerve happens to be really small. It's not very big at all. As a matter of fact, this right here is as big as the spinal nerve is. That's it. So the spinal nerve is coming out of the spine, and it's just going through that intervertebral foramen, and that's about as long as it is. It's as long as the intervertebral foramen, and then it divides, right? Then it's going to divide. Spinal nerves branch just lateral to the intervertebral foramen, and there are three branches. So we have, first we have the anterior ramus, the posterior ramus, and then we have these rami communicans, okay? So you do have to know just a little bit about these. Um, the, um, the posterior ramus is right here. So all of the neurons going through that posterior ramus, as soon as that spinal nerve splits, they're either sensory information coming from your back or motor commands going out to the skeletal muscles in your back, right? So that's the posterior um, ramus. Then we have the anterior ramus right here. And the anterior ramus contains both sensory and motor neurons that go to the ventrolateral surface of your body. So where's the ventrolateral surface of your body? Ventrolateral, where is that? Front and sides, right? So that makes sense so far. Anterior means the front, so it's going to the front, it's carrying neurons to the front and the side, right? And then we have the, um, these rami communicons that we can see right down um, right here. Those are the rami communicons. And they're a part of the autonomic nervous system. And one of them is called a white ramus. And the other one is called a gray ramus. One of them contains myelinated neurons. One of them contains gray um, neurons, um, contains unmyelinated neurons. Which one do you think is which? Gray is unmyelinated. White is myelinated right? So they're basically going to carry, if you remember the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, where does most of the information go? To glands, right? To glands and viscera. So that's basically carrying the, um, all of the visceral commands. Whereas the anterior and posterior, they're pretty much carrying the somatic commands. So this is just a mapping of the spinal cord. That's all this is. So what do you have to memorize for the exam? Where does the sensory and motor information from your back come from? Or where, what, um, what branch of the spinal nerve are those, is that information travel through? And you would say posterior. Where would the information um, from your um, front or your sides which branch of the spinal nerve would that travel through? And then you would say anterior. Where would information and motor commands for your viscera, what branch of the spinal nerve would that travel through? And you would say the rami communicans. So this is, this is the dermatomes. Now the spinal nerves, each spinal nerve is going to be responsible for monitoring a specific area of skin, right? And so when we look at the mapping, we can see, we look at, you know, go up here and we look at the head and, and the shoulders, we can see actually which spinal nerve is innervating which area of the, of the skin. So like down here we can see T3, right? T3 is kind of monitoring this area of the skin. So any sensory information, like if there's a cut right here in that area of the skin, that's gonna go into your spinal cord through the T3 spinal nerve, right? If you have a cut way down here, there's a cut that's gonna go in through the T9 spinal nerve. And remember, they're paired. So it would be the T9 on the right. The right T9 spinal nerve would be affected, okay? Now, sometimes the dorsal root can get infected, like I said, with a chickenpox virus. And so then that chickenpox virus can cause a very painful rash 
as well as blisters all along a dermatome, depending on what spinal nerve is infected. So you might see that, you know, um, in your when you're out practicing. So if a if say the chickenpox virus attacked the T1 spinal uh, nerve, right? It attacked the T1, the dorsal root coming into that T1 spinal nerve. There might be a rash and blisters all along that dermatome. Have you guys seen shingles before? Do you know what shingles look like? Right, they're just very painful. Um, most of the time, people, if you have had the chicken pox when you're young, you can get shingles when you're older, right? And most people will only have shingles once in their life, but if they are some type of um, immunocompromised, if their immune system's down a little bit, like elderly people, um, pregnant women, um, AIDS or um, HIV, anyone that's immunocompromised, they can get that more than once. They can get shingles more than once. Now, the other thing is that if uh, one of the spinal nerves is damaged, because that can happen too, you get a herniated disc, right? And the herniated disc starts bulging and it's pinching on that spinal nerve, then that person can get pain all the way through um, that dermatome area. So if we look down here a little bit lower, you know, if a person has an L4-5 bulging disc, right, and it's, and it's, um, this, it's actually pinching on or pressing on that L4 um, spinal nerve, they can get sharpshooting pains down that dermatome. They can get uh, what we call paresthesias, which is like numb, which is like ants crawling. It feels like a little um, tingling or vibration. They can get numbness in those areas. And it's all relative to how hard is that nerve being, um, how hard is it being pinched or how hard is it being damaged? So just a little touch of that herniated disc is gonna probably cause just a little bit of tingling maybe. Press it a little harder. If it's a bigger bulge, then you're gonna get more of a sharp shooting pain. Press it even harder and then you're gonna get numbness, right? So that, that's how the doctors can say, you know, with a pinwheel, they can go through and they can touch certain areas and they're looking to see what areas are numb because then they can trace it back to the spinal nerve and then they can determine that way which, um, which vertebrae might be bulging out, which one might have a herniated disc. All right, so when we look at the spinal cord, um, when, those, when those neurons come out through the spinal nerve and then they branch off, right? As they're branching off, they're gonna mingle with the branches from other spinal nerves. And as they're mingling with these branches of other spinal nerves, they start to form what we call a plexus. So if we look at the cervicals up here, okay, we have the cervical plexus. The cervical plexus is in the cervical spine, and it's from the cervical spine, uh, the, the spinal nerves from C1 to C4, okay, C1 to C4. So each one of these, C1 to C4, are going to be in the cervical plexus. And so those spinal nerves, as the neurons come through, and they're all gonna go out through the dorsal and the uh, ventral and the rami communicans, as they're going out, they're gonna start to mingle with the neurons from other, um, from each one of these spinal nerves. So they combine and then they separate. And as they separate at the very end, when they separate out, they will separate into what we call peripheral nerves. Right? So they combine and separate, combine again, and then they become peripheral nerves. It's these peripheral nerves that we start to name. We name them. So the main peripheral nerve that you need to know from the cervical um, plexus is the phrenic nerve. That's the one I want you to know from the cervical plexus. What does the phrenic nerve go to? Do you guys know? What does it innervate? It innervates the diaphragm. What does the diaphragm do? Helps you to breathe, right? Helps you to breathe. So if you have damage to the spinal cord in that area, anywhere in that area, you're not gonna be able to breathe on your own and the phrenic nerve would not be able to send out commands to the diaphragm so that you would breathe, right?
So that's uh, one of the nerves that you have to know. That's the only one that you have to know from the cervical plexus. Then we have the brachial plexus, and the brachial plexus is, um, other, another name for that now is thoracic plexus. They changed it, so it can either be brachial or thoracic. Your docs are going to call it the brachial plexus. Okay? But that is from the, it's from the neurons from the spinal nerve C5 to T1. So anywhere from C5 to T1. Right? That's the brachial plexus. And again, now they are, it's a little more complicated than the cervicals. They're going to combine, divide, combine, divide, combine again. So then they become, um, they're going to become trunks, then cords, and then finally they're going to become these nerves. And the nerves, the nerves that come out of there are going to innervate the arm. So the cervical plexus, those nerves are all innervating the neck. The brachial plexus, they're going to innervate the arms. They're going to send motor commands to the arms. Right? So cervical plexus is the neck. Brachial plexus are the arms. So the nerves, there's the axillary nerve, and there's the musculocutaneous nerve. There's the um, radial nerve, the ulnar nerve, the median nerve. And so a lot of those you have on your lab list, and you have to know, you have to be able to identify where they are. You don't have to know which spinal roots make up those, those specific um, nerves, right? But you have to be able to identify them on a model. Okay, then we have the lumbar plexus, and the lumbar plexus is from T12 down to L4. T12 to L4. So the neuro, that's where the neurons are coming from, the T12 spinal nerve all the way down to the L4. There's only one neuron that I want you to know about coming from the lumbar plexus, and that is the femoral nerve. And so we see the femoral nerve here. Okay, So the femoral nerve is going to come down, and then it's going to split right away. So you only see that femoral nerve, it's like on the front, on the front of the thigh, and you're going to see it divide pretty quickly. As soon as it passes through that inguinal ligament, it then splits, right? So um, you'll just have to identify it a little bit further up, a little more proximal, closer to that inguinal uh, ligament, right? Then we have the last plexus, which is called the sacral plexus, and the sacral plexus uh, is from the spinal nerves S1 to S4. And the main nerve that you have to know from that one is the sciatic nerve. Now those are the main peripheral nerves coming from those plexuses, right? But then they're going to divide as well. All of those peripheral nerves will end up dividing. And one of the divisions that you need to know is uh, when the femoral nerve divides, one of its... Um, one of, the, one of the nerves that comes off of the femoral nerve is called the saphenous nerve. So that's another nerve that you have to know on the lab exam. Now we're going to talk about interneurons. So let's just go back and uh, review what nerve plexuses are. They are a complex interwoven network of nerves that control the neck, the upper limbs, and the lower limbs. The cervical plexus consists of spinal nerves C1 to C5, and its branches are going to uh, innervate or give nerve supply to the muscles of the neck and the diaphragm. And the phrenic nerve is the major nerve of the cervical plexus that innervates the diaphragm. The brachial plexus consists of spinal nerves C5 to T1. The brachial plexus will uh, innervate the pectoral girdle and the upper limb or the upper arms. There are several nerves that come from the brachial plexus. They are the median, ulnar, radial, axillary, and musculocutaneous. Then there are the lumbar and sacral plexuses. The lumbar plexus consists of spinal nerves T12 to L4. And the femoral nerve is the major nerve that comes from the lumbar plexus. Other major nerves from the lumbar plexus include the genitofemoral, nerve and the lateral femoral nerve. One of the branches of the femoral nerve is the saphenous nerve. 
The sacral plexus contains axons from spinal nerves L4 to S4. The sciatic nerve is the major nerve, but the pudendal nerve is another major nerve from the sacral plexus. The sciatic nerve will branch and give rise to the peroneal and the tibial nerves. Now we're going to start looking at reflexes, and before we do that, I need to just mention what interneurons are. So we talked about sensory neurons, and we talked about motor neurons, uh, but there's also interneurons. In the human body, there are about 10 million sensory neurons that carry sensory information to the central nervous system and into the brain. There are about one half a million motor neurons that carry motor commands from the brain out to effectors, but there are about 20 billion interneurons in the body. An interneuron is a neuron that transmit impulses between other neurons. They are especially seen as a part of a reflex arc. A neuronal pool is a functional group of a whole bunch of interconnected neurons. There are two main patterns in how these neurons interconnect. One is called divergence and one is called convergence. So divergence is the spread of information from one neuron to several neurons or from one pool of neurons to multiple pools of neurons. For example, a sensory neuron brings information into the central nervous system and that's distributed to neuronal pools in the spinal cord and the brain. The other common pattern of neuronal pools is convergence. Convergence is where several neurons uh, converge onto the same postsynaptic neuron. For example, conscious and subconscious control of breathing muscles. So there might be one neuron bringing your conscious control of your breathing muscles and another neuron might be converging on that same postsynaptic neuron bringing subconscious control of those breathing muscles. We're going to be looking at these interneurons as we introduce reflexes. Reflexes are rapid automatic responses to specific stimuli. Reflexes are necessary in order to keep us safe. So what I want to talk about now is the reflex arc. A reflex arc is the wiring of a single reflex. So the reflex arc begins at a receptor and then it will end at a peripheral effector. An effector can be a skeletal muscle fiber, it can be a gland, it can be anything that can respond. There are five steps in a neural reflex, and the first step is the arrival of a stimulus, and then that stimulus will activate a receptor. A receptor is a specialized cell, or even the dendrites of a sensory neuron, and we're going to talk more about receptors in chapter 15. But receptors are sensitive to physical or chemical changes in the body um, or in the external environment. For example, if you put your hand on a tack, that would activate pain receptors in your skin, which are actually the dendrites of sensory neurons. But if the doctor takes a reflex hammer and taps the patellar tendon of your knee, you're going to get a different type of reflex. And um, that's sort of where I'm going to start now. I'm going to show you the receptors of the reflex and then we're going to talk about the different steps. So first of all, we have an arrival of a stimulus and the activation of a receptor. So what you're seeing here are fibers of a muscle cell, and we have extrafusal fibers and we have intrafusal fibers. So these are the extrafusal fibers and these are the intrafusal fibers. So when uh, the doctor taps on your knee, the receptors that are going to be activated are these intrafusal fibers. And these intrafusal fibers then will generate a, an action potential in a sensory neuron. The second step then is the activation of that sensory neuron. So the stimulation that is not pain, it was just a, a stretch of these intrafusal fibers, 
it leads to an action potential on this sensory neuron. And um, the action potential propagates along the axon and the neuron enters into the spinal cord through the dorsal or posterior root and will synapse on the gray matter of the spinal cord. So in this case, the sensory receptors are a different cell, but in other cases, like with pain, the sensory receptors are actually the dendrites of the sensory neuron. Step three is information processing. Information processing begins when a neurotransmitter is released at the synaptic terminal of the sensory neuron and the um, neurotransmitter binds to the postsynaptic membrane of an interneuron or of a motor neuron and this produces an EPSP or a graded potential. Sometimes the interneurons are involved and sometimes they're not. The sensory neurons can directly innervate a motor neuron, which is what we would see in a monosynaptic reflex. In step four, a motor neuron is activated. So the neurotransmitter binds to the motor neuron and it generates an action potential. And that action potential will propagate down the axon of the motor neuron and the motor neuron is going to exit the spinal cord through the ventral root. The motor neuron then travels to the effector, and in the case of tapping the uh, patellar tendon and creating the leg to kick, causing the leg to kick, that motor neuron will then um, go to the quadriceps muscles. So the quadricep muscle then is the effector. Now the motor neuron is going to synapse on the extrafusal muscle fibers. The extrafusal muscle fibers are the muscle fibers that contract and cause that leg to kick out. So step five then is the response of the peripheral effector. So the release of the neurotransmitter by the motor neuron at the, the synaptic terminal of the motor neuron will lead to a muscle contraction and cause the leg to kick. Here maybe. So here we have the arrival of a stimulus. So the first thing we have is the stimulus. There's the stimulus on the knee. The second thing is the receptor has to detect that. So then we have a receptor that's going to detect that. Then the receptor is going to stimulate the sensory neuron. And that sensory neuron is going to bring that information all the way into the spinal cord. And that sensory neuron is going to synapse onto a motor neuron. So the next thing is the motor neuron is going to go out to the quadricep muscle. That's a motor neuron. And then the quadricep muscle is going to contract. It's always the same. There's always a stimulus, there's always a receptor, there's always a sensory neuron, motor neuron, and then an effector. It's always the same. If we look at the spinal cord, the receptor detects the pain or the temperature change or whatever it is, that information travels in through the dorsal root. It's going to synapse onto the motor neuron. And the motor neuron is going to exit through that ventral gray horn, out through the ventral root, and go out to the effector. These, these um, reflexes can be super simple, just like this. Receptor, sensory neuron, motor neuron, effector, right? It can be that simple. And in this case, if it is that simple, there is only one synapse that's occurring in the spinal cord. One synapse. So then that reflex, we would say, is monosynaptic. One synapse, mono means one. So that's monosynaptic. It's very simple. 
That's what happens when you're tapping that knee. In through the sensory, out through the motor, kick. In the polysynaptic reflexes, it's more than just one sensory and one motor neuron. There's two different types that we're really going to look at. There's a withdrawal reflex and the acrostic sensor reflex, but they are going to involve interneurons. So polysynaptic has the sensory and the motor neuron, but it also includes interneurons. So if we, if we saw this here, um, the sensory neuron goes in, it's going to synapse, but it'll synapse onto an interneuron, then that interneuron will synapse onto the motor neuron, and then the motor neuron will exit the ventral gray horn through the ventral root and go out to the effector. The other thing is that inner neuron, not only does it go in between the sensory and the motor neuron, but it's probably also going to head up to the brain to tell your brain what's going on. Right? So we're going to see polysynaptic reflexes when that sensation is pain. So all painful, all painful stimuli are going to elicit a polysynaptic reflex. Let's look at how reflexes can be classified. There's um, four different um, classifications of reflexes. You're going to need to know the examples of them. They can be either classified by development. They can be classified by um, where are they um, like originating from, by their response, and um, by the complexity of the circuit. Reflexes can be classified in any one of four ways. They can be classified by their development. So was a person born with these reflexes or did they have to acquire them? They can also be classified by the site where the information was processed. Was the information processed right in the spinal cord or was it processed in the brain? They can also be classified by the nature of the resulting motor response. So what was the effector? Was it a somatic response? Was it a skeletal muscle? Or was it a visceral response? Was it an organ? And they can also be classified based on their complexity of the neural circuit that's involved. Is it just one synapse or is it multiple synapses? So let's just briefly describe these and give a couple of examples of them. So first of all, let's look at um, classifying them by their development. So with this classification, we're looking at were these reflexes something that you were born with or did you have to acquire them? So under development, these reflexes could be either innate or acquired. Innate reflexes are ones that are genetically programmed reflexes. So for example, when a baby is first born, the baby has a suckling reflex. If you put a finger or a nipple or a bottle into the baby's mouth, the baby will immediately start suckling. This is a reflex that's stimulated by sen uh, sensory stimulation on the roof of the mouth. Babies also can withdraw from pain as soon as they're born. So if you tap the bottom of their foot or prick the bottom of their foot, they'll withdraw from pain. This is an innate reflex. An acquired reflex, on the other hand, is more complex. It's a motor pattern that's learned. For example, a person that's been driving and has experienced driving, if a ball or um, something rolls out in front of their car as they're driving down the road, they will reflexively slam on the brakes. This is a reflex that is, re is um, acquired. It's something that they had to um, develop through um, repeated motor motor patterns. Then we can classify reflexes by the site of where they are the information is processed. So the processing sites can either be in the spine or in the brain. A spinal reflex is when the um, sensory neuron will synapse onto the motor neuron right in the spinal cord and this is a very important for processing events right in the spinal cord so the reflex can happen very, very quickly, like pulling your hand away from a, a hot burner.
Uh, then there's the cranial reflex, and these are reflexes that are processed in the brain. So, for example, there's an area in the brain that when you hear a very loud noise or you see a very bright light, you, your body will jump away from those things. And those reflexes occur in the brain, so those are called cranial reflexes. Or, for example, when you shine a light onto the pupil of the right eye, uh, in the right eye, that pupil um, constricts because of the bright light. The left eye, that left pupil will constrict as well, and that's a cranial reflex. Another classification is the nature of the response. And so that means um, you're either looking at a somatic response or a visceral response. If it's a somatic reflex, that means that there will be an involuntary um, contraction of skeletal muscles. For instance, when you're tapping the, the tendon in the knee and then the leg kicks because the quadricep muscle contracted. That's a somatic reflex. But there's also visceral reflexes. So these are reflexes that are going to uh, occur in your glands or smooth muscles. So, for example, if you think about uh, sucking on a lemon, your salivary glands might start secreting. That's a visceral reflex. With the somatic reflexes, the movements aren't going to be delicate or even precise. But the somatic reflexes are vital because they are immediate and they will move your body away from something that um, might appear to be dangerous. Voluntary responses would be way too slow to react to some of the stimuli that the somatic reflexes respond to. And then the last way to classify uh, reflexes are the complexity of the circuit. So if there's just two neurons involved, if there's just the uh, sensory neuron and that synapse is onto a motor neuron, that means there's only one synapse and we call that a monosynaptic reflex. The monosynaptic reflex is the simplest reflex arc. It's, uh, again, where the sensory neuron synapses directly on a motor neuron. There's no interneuron involved. And so that synapse right there serves as the processing center. Uh, in a more complex reflex called a polysynaptic reflex, there will be interneurons involved. And uh, so there will be uh, more of a synaptic delay. In the monosynaptic reflex, there's very little synaptic delay because there's only one synapse. But in a polysynaptic reflex, there will be at least two synapses. So there would be a little bit more of a synaptic delay. Most types of reflexes have at least one interneuron between the sensory and the motor neurons. So now let's take a look at spinal reflexes. And as I mentioned earlier, spinal reflexes range in complexity from a very simple monosynaptic reflex that only involves one synapse to a polysynaptic reflex that involves many synapses. So we'll start with a monosynaptic reflex. Uh, in a monosynaptic reflex, uh, there's very little delay between the sensory input and the motor output because there is only one synapse. And um, monosynaptic reflexes are going to control the most rapid responses of the nervous system. And so an example here is the stretch reflex. So the stretch reflex provides automatic regulation of the skeletal muscle length. The stimulus is always going to be a stretching of the muscle. So as soon as the muscle feels like it's being stretched, it will activate a sensory neuron, and then the sensory neuron triggers an immediate motor response, which is going to be contraction of that stretched muscle. And then that counteracts the stimulus. So action potentials to and from the spinal cord are going to be conducted along large myelinated type A fibers, which we, are no, which we know are the fastest um, transmitting nerve fibers. The patellar reflex is also called the knee jerk reflex. This reflex occurs when there's a tap on the patellar tendon and that stretches the muscle spindles and the quadriceps and that results in a, qua a contraction then of that stretched quadricep muscle. As I mentioned earlier, the muscle spindles are the sensory receptors involved in the stretch reflex. The muscle spindles consist of the interfusal muscle fibers. 
that consist of a bundle of small specialized skeletal muscle fibers and each interfusal muscle fiber is innervated by both sensory and motor neurons. The dendrites of the sensory neuron surrounds the central portion of each interfusal fiber. So as soon as that interfusal fiber is stretched, it will generate an action potential in that sensory neuron. And um, those action potentials then will travel to the spinal cord. The dendrites of the sensory neuron surround the central portion of each interfusal fiber and are very sensitive to any changes in the length of those interfusal fibers. There are also motor neurons that innervate the interfusal fibers, and those motor neurons are called gamma motor neurons. The gamma motor neurons keep the intrafusal fibers slightly contracted, which makes them very sensitive to changes in the length of the muscle. When the sensory neuron synapses directly onto the motor neuron, the synaptic terminals of the motor neuron will contact the extrafusal fibers of the quadriceps muscle. The extrafusal fibers and the interfusal fibers will both contract at the same time then and cause the contraction of the quadricep muscle causing the leg to kick out. The extrafusal muscle fibers also help to set the resting muscle tone. So this means that the muscle fibers are slightly contracted even at rest and this helps to resist any type of overstretching. A postural reflex is a stretch reflex that maintains normal upright posture so that your muscles are contracting, allowing you to sit or stand as a reflex without your conscious control of your muscles. Now let's look at polysynaptic reflexes. Polysynaptic reflexes can produce more complicated responses than monosynaptic reflexes. We're gonna talk about several different polysynaptic reflexes. We'll talk about the Golgi tendon reflex, a withdrawal reflex, a flexor reflex, and then a crossed extensor reflex. First, let's talk about the Golgi tendon reflex, and I don't have a picture of this, so I'm gonna move this aside here. So the first one we're gonna talk about is the Golgi tendon reflex. So like the name implies, the receptor is going to be in the tendon. And so Golgi tendon reflexes are um, these nerve endings that are encapsulated in the collagen fibers of tendons where they meet the muscles. And they are sensitive to any type of um, uh, excessive uh, force. So they help to prevent the muscles from uh, too much tension on the tendons. And the sensory neurons of the Golgi tendon organs will pass then through the dorsal root to the spinal cord. And then in the spinal cord, the neurons stimulate an inhibitory interneuron that will innervate the motor neurons controlling the skeletal muscle. The greater the tension in the tendon, the greater the inhibitory effect on the motor neuron. So basically what happens is if there's too much stretch on the tendon and it, the tendon is... Um, going to tear away from the muscle, the inhibition of the motor neuron will cause that muscle to completely relax. So we see this in weightlifters, for example, who are trying to lift a weight that's too, too much for them. Um, their, their inhibition of their motor neuron happens very quickly and they will just, uh, their muscles stop contracting and they drop the weight. Uh, and that's in order to prevent any type of tearing of the muscle or the tendon. So the next type of reflex that we're going to look at are withdrawal reflexes, and there's both a flexor reflex and a crossed extensor reflex that are withdrawal reflexes. The withdrawal reflexes move the affected body parts away from the source of stimulation. The strongest withdrawal reflexes are triggered by painful stimuli. So let's look at a flexor reflex. So let's look at a reflexor reflex. So we'll look here, this is the withdrawal reflex. So during a withdrawal reflex, this flexor reflex is what we're seeing here. Um, 
this is where there's pain. So here you see the hand, the hand is touching a hot pan that stimulates a sensory neuron. The sensory neuron synapses onto the interneuron. The interneuron synapses onto the motor neuron. That motor neuron extends out to the biceps muscle and stimulates the bicep muscle to contract and that pulls very quickly the hand away from the hot pan. At the same time, the interneuron, uh, it diverges and has segments going up to up the spinal cord to areas in your brain because your brain needs to be aware that this has happened to be able to decide what to do about it, if, you know, to be able to process uh, what has just happened, to be able to take care of your injury, um, to make decisions. For instance, you need to be able to attend to your wound with first aid. You need to make decisions about whether you need to contact a doctor. You have to um, be able to turn off the stove. So there's, there's uh, decisions that your brain has to make, and that's why those inner neurons are involved. We can also see that in here, this example here. So this is another flexor reflex. And this is where uh, here you are stepping, a person is stepping on a tack and that causes pain in the foot. So the sensory neuron extends into the um, spinal cord and that synapses onto an inner neuron, which synapses onto a motor neuron going to the flexors of the leg on the same side. And so your quadricep muscles flex and you pull your foot away from the source of that pain. So with this flexor reflex, you step on a tack and that results in contraction of the flexor muscles on that same side that you stepped on the tack, as well as relaxation of the antagonist muscles, which would be your hamstrings. So by stepping on a tack on that same leg, you're stimulating your flexor muscles and you're inhibiting your extensor muscles so that you can pull your leg away from that tack very quickly. This is called reciprocal inhibi inhibition. So when one set of motor neurons is stimulated uh, and then another set of neurons that control the antagonistic muscles are inhibited, that is reciprocal inhibition. The stretch reflex where we take the hammer and hit the patellar ligament, as well as the tendon reflex where the tendons get overstretched and they cause inhibition of the muscles uh, so you don't overstretch the tendon. And now this withdrawal reflex, this flexor reflex, um, they all have sensory and motor events that occur on the same side of the body. So when you step on a tack, your leg on that same side of your body pulls away from the tack. When you tap the tendon on your um, uh, your patellar tendon, it's that same quadricep muscle on the same side of the body that's going to contract. When you're lifting weights that are too heavy, it's on the same side that's going to be inhibited and relax. So because they're occurring on the same side of the body, we say that these are ipsilateral reflex arcs. So ipsy means same, lateral side. So same side reflex arcs. When the stimulus and then the reaction all occur on the same side. Now there are the last set of reflexes that I want to mention which are called crossed extensor reflexes and these reflexes involve contralateral reflex arcs which means that even though the stimulus is happening on one side of the body the reflex and the response is going to happen on the other side of the body. The crossed extensor reflex complements the flexor reflex, and these two reflexes are going to occur simultaneously. So when you have that flexor reflex and you're stepping on a tack and pulling your leg away, if you did not have this crossed extensor reflex, you would then fall down. So the crossed extensor reflex is going to control the opposite leg and make sure that that leg can support your body weight so you won't fall down. The motor response to a contralateral reflex is going to occur on the opposite side of the body.
So when you step on the tack, your flexor reflex pulls your foot away, but your crossed extensor reflex stiffens your other leg to support your body weight. The last reflex that I want to mention is called the Babinski reflex. The Babinski reflex is one of the normal reflexes in infants. The Babinski reflex occurs after the sole of the foot has been firmly stroked. The big toe then moves upward or toward the top surface of the foot and the other toes fan out. In an infant under two years of age, this is a normal sign. If this were to happen in an adult or a children over two years of age, where the big toe moves upward and toward the top surface of the foot and the other toes fan out, we would say this is a positive Babinski sign. If stroking the bottom of the foot causes the big toe to bend up and back and the other toes to fan out. If a positive Babinski sign occurs in adults or children over two years of age, this can mean that there might be an underlying nervous system or brain condition that's causing the reflexes to react abnormally. In an adult or a child over two years of age, the normal uh, reflex would be a plantar reflex that presents as a downward flexion of the toes toward the source of the stimulus. It's actually wrong to say that the Babinski reflex is positive or negative because actually it's either present or it's absent. So if it's present and the person is under two years of age, that would be normal. But if it's present in an adult or a child over two years of age, that would be abnormal. Okay, this ends chapter 13 lecture.